they haven't seen anything close to the sheer volume of casualties. Badly injured, very frightened people are pouring in. No exaggeration As by you can see behind me, the whole area has deteriorated into a scene of chaos. Deep throat laceration, even a large section of flesh torn We've away. We've been told by nurses there have been complications. Almost all wounds have shown immediate infection. Doctors are still at a loss as to the reason behind these attacks, and the situation doesn't seem to be improving. The past few minutes, I've seen four ambulances and several cars Speculation pull up. Speculation seems to surround the origin of this phenomenon. Our story begins in a small house just west of Riverside. The pride of the mighty Ohio. July 9th, 1993. Two firefighters found themselves inside of a small home just west of Riverside. They don't remember how many days has passed since the mysterious virus first started spreading. They don't know if there are any survivors or what has happened to their families. But one thing is certain. They must do whatever it takes to survive. After a fair bit of scavenging, the man in the hat emerged from the small house. He realized that their location was within walking distance of the local gas station. And if he remembered correctly, there should be a police station right next to it. The two of them walked cautiously, but as they neared the end of the fence, two zombies picked up their scent. They knew they had to act quickly if they wanted to avoid a gruesome fate. Unfazed by the undead horror that stood before them, they sprung into action with lightning-fast reflexes. Exhibiting deadly position and unflinching determination, they dispatched the zombies with ruthless efficiency. Taking cover along the backside of the gas station, they remained vigilant, their eyes trained on the movement of the nearby horde like hunters stalking their prey. Yet despite their training and expertise, even the most skilled hunter can fall victim to the unpredictable and relentless nature of the undead. In the face of danger, the man in the hat acted with swift precision, immediately turning and alerting his companion to the threat. They split up, each hoping to draw a portion of the horde away in order to escape unnoticed. Using nearby obstacles to their advantage, the two survivors managed to reunite with only a handful of zombies still in pursuit. With the speed born of necessity, the two men laid waste to the oncoming horde of zombies. Each of them claimed a trophy, a memento of their brutal but necessary victory. The man in the hat was called Dupli, a name given to him by the narrator, born of pure imagination and chaos. However, further investigation revealed that the seemingly meaningless moniker had in fact been used by two families who lived in Pennsylvania in the year 1880. What an unexpected twist of fate. Deep within the confines of the police station, Dupli and his companion stumbled upon a locked room concealed from view by a heavy security door. The door, they realized, could only be opened with a key or appropriate tool, adding to the mystery and intrigue of what lay hidden behind it. Driven by their gnawing hunger and insatiable thirst, the two men trudged wearily towards a nearby restaurant, desperate for sustenance and hydration. The man wielding the shotgun introduced himself as Helen Keller, a name that gave duply pause. He recognized the moniker as belonging to a renowned American author and political activist who, despite being deaf and blind, had achieved remarkable feats of communication and literacy. She must have been his idol. Dupli mused quietly to himself, acknowledging the extraordinary resilience and determination that the Keller symbol. Who wrote this? Who talks like that? As the two men armed themselves with decent weapons, their confidence grew. Encouraged by their newfound sense of security, they resolved to explore the parking lot in search of a means of transportation. They methodically moved from one car to another, meticulously assessing engine statuses and battery conditions. Their search intent on finding keys conveniently left in the ignition. However, strangely enough, the thought of checking the seats and glove box never crossed their minds, and this peculiar behavior continued for days on end leaving them empty-handed in their search for transportation. After an exhaustive search, the two men found themselves back at the gas station. Though a few zombies still lurked about, it was clear that the horde they had distracted earlier had not returned. Braving the remaining undead, they entered the convenience store with the intention of gathering supplies. Dupli's attention was drawn to a magazine with a welding mask emblazoned on its cover. 
The Metalwork Magazine, Volume Two. Though not his usual reading material, Dupli found himself engrossed in its contents, learning how to make simple contraptions from its pages. He mused to himself that had the outbreak never occurred, he likely would never have picked up a book to read voluntarily. As he pored over the various books and magazines, he felt his frayed nerve begin to settle. For a brief moment, he allowed himself to imagine that this was just an ordinary day of shopping in a store. The sound of Helen shuffling merchandise in the background, combined with the tranquility of the moment, created an indescribable sense of serenity. He could almost hear the cheesy pop music playing once again, the distant chatter of other customers, and the sound of cars driving in and out the gas station. As the morning light broke through the darkness, they left the store and made their way back to the police station once again. A solitary zombie trailed behind them, but they swiftly dispatched it. To their astonishment, the lone zombie held the key to the locked room. With eager anticipation, they entered the room, discovering a cache of bullets, guns, and police equipment. But little did Dupli know that this very room would become the setting for the loss of his partner. You see, surviving a world overrun by zombies requires one to avoid certain actions at all costs. These include avoiding being bitten, refraining from drinking exposed water, and perhaps most importantly, using firearms sparingly and only when absolutely necessary. In an urban environment, the sound of a fired bullet can carry for a distance of one to two kilometers. If you ever played a zombie-themed video game or watched a TV show in that genre, you should know that this kind of noise will inevitably attract unwanted attention. This is especially true when you possess little to no aiming skills. Oh my God, they're not dying. This is like 50% accuracy. Ah. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. Just keep walking. Oh, you can also push them with the stock. Watch out near you! I'm reloading. Ooh. This is not what I had in mind. Ah, that's a lot of them. That'd be a bad idea. Oh fuck. Or shit. Uh just keep walking. Oh my god. Ooh, that's a lot of them. Yeah, start shooting, bro. I want to, man, I just can't hit them. <laughs> my bullet doesn't hit them. I know. Oh my god, we're just gonna gather more. Look, they're making trains. Oh, I'm out of ammo. God damn it, we gotta, we gotta find a place to hide, Dude. man. <laughs> we gotta go somewhere. Oh shit. Get inside the police station. That is so many. Oh yeah, go inside this gas station first. I suck at shooting! <laughs> I suck at shooting! Wash, we're gonna wash my rags first. Oh shit, they broke the window. Shit, okay. Oh my god, we gotta go. We gotta go. We gotta I'm go. Coming. I'm coming, I'm Come coming. On. We gotta go. Shit! Ooh. I got bit. Ah, oh, I got bit too. <laughs> Fuck. With no time to tend to their wounds, Dupli and Helen hurled themselves out of the windows and raced towards the PlayStation. Their plan was to barricade themselves inside of the safe room and take down zombies as they attempted to break through the doorway. At the time, their plan seemed solid, but they failed to evaluate the structural integrity of the safe room door and overlooked the fact that the room had no exit. Uh, no, not yet, not yet. Open. Ah, uh, uh, the <laughs> well, There you go. Yes. All right. Let me. We just... should be. Good. We should be good here. Yeah. Let me just lock doors. I locked it. Oh shit! You know what? This this room doesn't have a second exit. If they break through, like we we're kind of fucked. Uh, there's, there's five of them. One, two, three, four, five, yeah. Um, okay. Guess we're fucking trapped. I don't know what to do, bro. I don't either. Oh! <laughs> 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 Uh, uh. Oh, I'm dead. I'm dead. You are? I'm, yeah, I'm dead. 
As Helium found himself surrounded, bitten multiple times, and collapsed to the ground, Dupli was devastated. But in a sudden moment of desperation, his instincts took over, and he stormed out of the door, leaping out of the window in a frenzied attempt to escape. Despite the shock causing his leg to go half asleep and making it impossible for him to run, Dupli's body refused to give up, and he kept moving forward. The loss of Helen had left him in an incredibly difficult situation, both emotionally and physically. Now facing solitude, he had to push himself to the extreme, and he's back. It's a video game. Alright. That's fine. This thing. That's okay. That's alright. I just spent the last 45 minutes writing up that shit, but it's okay. It's a job. I don't have to love it. It's fine. It just work. <sighs> Reunited with Helen, who now inhabited a feminine form, the duo resumed their quest to gather supplies and secure transportation. Nonetheless, their attempts to find transportation were met with disappointment yet again, as the mental challenges they each faced persisted in obstructing their progress, casting a pall over their efforts. When it comes to gathering supplies, their situation appeared more favorable. The street they found themselves on offered a little bit of everything. Food, weapons, books, and even duffel bags that they could use to distribute their load more effectively. The warehouse within the post and mail service store housed a vast collection of knowledge. As the building appeared relatively secure, the pair decided to spend the entire day there, immersed in reading and absorbing in the wealth of information before them. Oh, there's so many of them over here. Holy shit. They noticed a large group of walkers obstructing the road, with a black cargo van just a few steps behind them, picking their interest. Opting for a more discreet approach, they decided to cut through the residential area and approach the vehicle from the rear. This strategic maneuver led them to an even more valuable discovery than they had anticipated, a well-stocked tool shop. The tool shop offered a wide array of implements that could double as weapons. Hammers, screwdrivers, wrenches, handsaw, etc. These very items can also provide you with the means to perform unique tasks, such as disassembling and assembling structures, removing and installing vehicle parts, chopping and sawing wood, and so on. But the most significant aspect of this find was the likelihood of obtaining a sledgehammer. Metal pipe, metal sheet, welding rods. Duct tape, glue, electric. Oh shit, there's a lot of stuff. I got a hammer, crowbar. Holy shit, that's a lot of stuff. Screwdriver. No sledgehammer. Bummer. No nails, though. Man, shovel is the best weapon. Even soldiers use it. it says gardening. Oh, it does half. Oh my god, that's a lot of damage. Welding rods. Should Something. I take that? We can just put it in. Uh, we can just leave it in the inventory once we find a car. We're gonna come back and. I mean, that's the logic, but if we, <laughs> if we just can't find cars, working cars. Yep. The pair came to the sobering realization that despite their success in accumulating valuable supplies, their lack of transportation posed a significant challenge. Confronted by a dilemma, they pondered how they could possibly transport everything they had amassed from numerous locations across the town to a base of operations that had not yet been established. On July 12th, precisely one day later, their circumstances improved dramatically. They stumbled upon a drivable SUV, and to their surprise, the key had been left in the ignition. The engine, however, was in less than ideal condition. This meant that the vehicle would likely jerk and stall frequently. Regardless of its shortcomings, a car was still a car. Without hesitation, Dupli started siphoning gas from the other vehicles in the lot, eager to get their newly found transportation up and running. As the key turned and the engine roared to life, its powerful rumble marked the true beginning of their adventure. As Dupli and Helen embarked on their journey, our story comes to a halt. This is actually the first time I've played this game and recorded it at the same time. And I'm still not sure if it's a good idea or not. So if you enjoy this video or have any suggestions, please write them down in the comment sections as it would help me tremendously. This year, I want to push myself. 
and see if I can accomplish something by doing what I truly love. I mean, the pressure is great, as I am at an age where there isn't much time left on the table. And I thought to myself, if I don't act quickly and start taking things seriously, when I look back in a few years, I will most definitely regret it. You might think this is cheesy or dorky, but as some of you may know, I started making videos on a Chinese platform. I still remember when my first Minecraft video started to gain views, and I was staring at my phone, speechless. The happiness I felt on that day was one of a kind. I am a man with very few friends, and my life has been that way for a really long time. I was this close to dropping everything and saying, "Fuck it, I can survive on my own." But then seeing people, strangers, cheering me on and enjoying the things I made with my very own hands was just magical. And that feeling is what pushed me to keep making videos, no matter if the views are low or if the algorithm leaves me on red. I really enjoy doing this, and、um, I hope I can continue to do it until my eyes can no longer see straight. This has been only radio, opening himself up to the people who loves him and supports him. And I love you guys.